What a wonderful song. We, songs we have just sung. It has in fact lifted me up and I trust that it has lifted you up as well. This is now our time for prayer. So let us become still before God and bow together as I pray. Our loving God and Father in heaven, we come before you with praise and thanksgiving and in humble submission to you as the almighty, most holy, sovereign God. We bow before your throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We thank you and praise you for your great love and compassion for sinners like us that you gave your only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to become the Savior of mankind, to die on a cross in obedience to your good and perfect and pleasing will. Thank you, Lord, for what you have gone through, so that we could attain salvation through your death and resurrection. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, through our words and deeds done and those left undone. Because we are sinners, we have strayed from your ways, O Lord, and you alone can forgive sin. Have mercy on us and forgive our sin and help us that we may serve you better and please you more through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you for the assurance that our transgressions are being forgiven and removed from us as far as the East is from the West. Thank you for the assurance that we are now a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, your treasured possession, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into your wonderful light. As your chosen people, let this be our testimony, that you have given us life, and this life is in your Son. We who have your Son, and are in him, have eternal life, and shall never die. To you be the glory for ever and ever. Lord, help us in our daily lives that we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that we can stand firm in our spirit without hesitation, standing together for the faith, fearless and filled with joy. Whatever struggle may cross our path, Make us strong and courageous, always knowing that you are with us wherever we may go. We pray that we might hide your word in our hearts, that we might not sin against you, that by your word and by your spirit we may grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To you be the glory forever and ever. Lord, and now we commend to you the Sunday school teachers, and pray that you will bless them with wisdom and insight as they instruct the children and the young people to keep their ways and to live in accordance with your word. We pray also for Ray as he brings the word to us. Lord, let the words of his mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's just be quiet for a moment as we come to God's Word and ask Him to, to open our hearts to receive His Word. Father, as we come before You, we pray that You will open our hearts, that You will help us to concentrate on Your Word. Thank You for the Bible. Thank You for Your Word. Speak to us now through it, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading comes from Nehemiah chapter 4. They were busy on the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. And the, from Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 1. Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the, the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, 
What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, Yes, what are they building? If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. And then Nehemiah goes into prayer and he says, O oh, our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight. For they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. And Nehemiah goes on and he says, So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for his people had a mind to work. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the wall of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. Nehemiah carries on and he says, And we prayed to our God and set a God as a protection against them for day and night. That's where we end the Nehemiah reading for this morning. I turn your attention also to the New Testament as I read from Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. That was Paul writing to the Philippians. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. If you're awake 16 hours a day, you're in this world behind enemy lines 16 hours a day. Do you see that? You're hearing the world. You're being influenced by the world. If you do not spend time in the Word of God, copious amounts of time, if you do not spend time in prayer, if you do not spend time in the good fellowship of a sound church with other believers, you're not going to be able to overcome. And don't go out there looking for some TV evangelist to touch your life and give you power. Don't look for some silly gimmick. That's not going to help you with sin. What do you need? You need to study the Word of God. You need to pray for strength. You need to be in the fellowship of a very strong local church under elders that care about your soul and under elders that are preaching the exposition of God's Word. That's what you need. Short, sharp reminder. I think it's often the simple, well-worn truths, such as those expressed there by Paul Washer, that are most important. 
And we see the importance of all three of those. We've already seen it to an extent in Nehemiah. We're in our third part of this book as we make our way through Nehemiah. And especially the third thing he shared about growing and fighting sin, being in the people of God, being under the word of God, among the community of God. And so I invite you again to see that, particularly in our passage this morning. Come with me to Nehemiah 3 and 4, which, as Maria mentioned, records for us the building work beginning in earnest and making significant progress amidst growing opposition. And so we're going to look here under two headings, chapter 3 and 4. Essentially, the first heading deals with chapter 3 and the second, chapter 4. We're going to look at the holy city and we're going to look at the harassed city. The holy city and the harassed city. Well, firstly, the holy city. Now, if you look at chapter 3 and you just glance over it for a moment, sometimes this chapter is even glossed over by commentators. And at first glance, when you see all those names, you might think it's boring and it's unimportant. Now, when you feel that way, it's usually a signal that it's more important than you think. (laughs) And we need to work at it. As you look at chapter 3, there is a whole lot of names, and some of those names are actually repeated. It's actually not the same person, but some of them have the same name. Sometimes when that name is repeated, it means this person has built and then he's built again. And sometimes to distinguish them, you just see their family line that's mentioned there. But what's in a name as we look at chapter 3? Well, those names represent Israelites taking up the cause together of building this wall. They are, so to speak, all in. They are all in. And when you examine these names, you see a variety of people and abilities and skills involved in this building project. There are people from different stratas of society. There's working class and there's ruling class. There are the priests, for example, in verse 1. There are other leaders attending and community leaders. There are politicians and there are merchants. There are people with different gifts and skills. You'll see referred to craftsmen, perfumers, and goldsmiths. Look at verse 8, for example. Next to them, Uziel, the son of Harhaya. I should have given Mario to read this particular section, hey? One of the goldsmiths repaired. Next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers repaired. And they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Even operating outside of their skills, doing the building work. It's a bit like me. I'm no great handyman. I really struggle with that. But I love doing it, actually. I love testing myself, trying to prove myself. And when it turns out even half good, I'm really proud of myself. (laughs) Don't know about you. You're probably a great handyman, like Neil there at the back. Anything you want done, speak to Neil, by the way. And there are others here, too, who have that skill and equipped to do that. There's all sorts involved. And there are whole families working together. There are men, there are women, there are brothers building together. There are daughters building with their fathers. Verse 12. Next to him, Shalom, the son of Halohesh, ruler of the half-district of Jerusalem, repaired he and his daughters. It's all in, isn't it? In fact, it's not just locals from Jerusalem themselves, but there are people from around Jerusalem who have come to help. In fact, uh, scholars tell us up to a 20-mile radius around Jerusalem they've come. They've made sacrifices to come. They've left their own homes and their own fields and their own building projects to commit to this one task together. It really is all in, isn't it? All aboard. Well, it's almost all in. You may have noticed a little jarring note in verse 5. And next to them, the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve the Lord. It's a little jarring note, almost all in. We'll come back to that a little bit later. But all in all, excuse all the alls today, the picture here is really quite remarkable. It's some feat that Nehemiah has organized to take a discouraged, fearful group, to galvanize them and to set them to work like this. But notice in verse 1, it starts with the leaders, with the priests. They set the example. Verse 1, then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, And they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They set the example. 
for the people. At the Sheep Gate. The Sheep Gate is likely named after, you can look this up on Google if you want to see how all the walls and the gates were set. But the Sheep Gate is very significant. Most likely named after the sheep that used to pass through there for the sacrifices. And so the building goes on from there. Crucial place. The Sacrifice Gate, if you like. If you like, some have called it the Salvation Gate. And some have even said, and I'm not sure if this is quite right, but there's no bolts and bars on this gate as there are on others. Perhaps an indication that this salvation that's offered here is open to all. It's a great picture, isn't it? The sheep gate. Well, what are we to learn here from this chapter? I think there's at least three things I want to underline from this all-in effort. And really what I want you to see is how God is in all of this. Three things. There's genuine history, there's genuine gracious togetherness here, and there's a grumbling threat, of course, too. Firstly, in all this genuine history, we see God at work. If you scroll through the names mentioned here and their contributions, we are reading this today because God has seen fit to mention all of this by name and keep it in his inspired word for us. It matters. It underlines, I think, for us the historicity of this account. It doesn't read like a myth, does it? It reads like real history. These are the names of real people and families whose names, in fact, thanks to the biblical account, are forever etched into history. This crucial redemptive history of the people of God. Think of the war memorials, even in this city, or those you may have seen, where the names of those who who stood up and and fought for the cause, are there etched into the granite or into the marble forever. We have some names etched into our memorial wall at the corner. I don't know if you know about it or if you've seen it, but those are stones laid by the families of those who have passed. And you can go and have a look. It's beautiful and, and really poignant. And there you see their names and their dates, and it reminds us of their legacy and what they did and what they meant to their families and to this family of God. This is crucial history, etched into the history, his story, as we've said before. This is another generation, in fact, from that which was judged and packed off into exile by God. But they knew of the stories of pain and destruction and heartache and longing. And now they are proudly playing their part in a season of favor from God. But they too are sinners under the hand of God. And you'll see that if you take a closer look at some of the names. And if you think of Ezra, the companion volume to Nehemiah, Ezra the scribe, who is really uh, responsible for helping them rebuild the temple, there's some of those names mentioned here. So, for example, Malkijah in verse 11. Have a look there. Malkijah, the son of Haram and Hashub. Now, you just read his name and you may not make connect the dots but actually if you if you read in Ezra Melchizedek was one who had been convicted of wrong 13 years earlier under Ezra he married a foreign wife but by all accounts Melchizedek had put that right he'd said it straight he'd repented and now he could reaffirm his commitment to God and his people by participating in building the wall and there's one or two other names like that who have rather dodgy pasts <laughs> But here they are, joined and unified to God's people in building the walls. It's, it's wonderful, isn't it? What's in a name? Each and every name represents a story that matters, the story of God in their life. Second, and perhaps the key lesson here, is to underline the genuine togetherness of the people, their unity amidst their great diversity. The key repeated phrase in the section, of course, is next to him, and next to him, and next to them, and next to them. You see it throughout. It holds this chapter together. Nehemiah was clearly an inspiring and gifted leader and used by God to rally the people like this. But once again, we would say, all of this next to him is really next to God. He is their presence. He is with them. I got that same sense, just reminded of it as we gathered as God's people and singing, Behold our God. God is in this place. God is in that place with them. This is all of God. Now, God's name is not mentioned in chapter 3 at all. It's much like the book of Esther, isn't it? 
But his work is clearly evident. All this togetherness really is miraculous. It would be impossible without him. This is his doing, his preparing of the way, his mission, his equipping, his plan, his people with his gifting and his holy city set apart unto him. And all are involved for his glory. And what is his great desire? What is his great desire for them, for you and for me? Generations later, who participate in Christ together as the church, his great desire is a holy nation set apart unto him. It has always been. And pointing to him and laboring for his glory. And what is happening here reflects that. It's a great picture of church, isn't it? So this is, in the end, not about us. It's about the glory of God. It's not about just some building project. We don't apply Nehemiah that way. He was building a wall, and so when we built this over many years, 10, 15 years ago, actually that's not what Nehemiah is referring to. It's referring to the building that God is most concerned about. His church, who are called to spread his fame and glory across the earth. Peter calls it the holy temple, rising up. His church, his body. Just come with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. These were uh, already, you would have heard, perhaps contained in the prayers prayed in the service. But look at the images that Peter uses of the body, of the church. 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm not going to read it all, but do read through from chapter 2 verse 1. And you'll see the language of the church described as a family, as a holy temple. Living stones built around the chief cornerstone, Christ, rising up as a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then look at verse 9 and 10 as he describes the church further this way. Verse 9, but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Wonderful description of who you are if you're a believer in his church, his community. We are a body who has been shown mercy. And therefore we are to be a people who show mercy, who speak mercy, who act mercifully, and who have on our lips the mercy of God. We are his people. And we do this all for his excellencies, to proclaim his excellencies. That's what you and I share in Christ together. In him we are holy. In him we are blessed with mercy. In him we have all the gifts necessary to build his holy temple. In him we are a people of mercy with a message of mercy. Do you see how important this is? This is what God is doing. This is what he wants to do. This is how crucial it is. There is no such thing as lone ranger Christianity. Pursuing God's glory and kingdom purposes all by your lonesome self. No, this is togetherness. This is our mission. We build and we fight for his honor together. Tim Keller says this, we also have to build up the people of God. We each have a responsibility to do that. We do it differently today than they did in Nehemiah's day. We also need a wall around us in a sense so that we are helping people to be holy and separate. But we do that by sanctification through the means of grace and by his Holy Spirit. They were building a temporary city with a physical wall. We are building the ultimate eternal city through conversion. That is what the New Testament tells us. We are making people citizens of that city through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are building that city when we do the work of the church. There is no greater task in this world, no greater privilege than to stand together proclaiming his excellencies with the gospel of Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Savior, on our lips. That is what we're called to do, and we're called to do it together. 
That's why Paul urges us in Ephesians 4 to guard our unity, to keep the unity of the Spirit. You are one. We reflect, in a sense, the oneness of God and His unity as the Trinity. We are called to reflect that. It is crucial to accomplish this mission. Every one of you, friends, sitting here who calls yourself a Christian is a part of the body of Christ. That came with the package. You had no choice. You might look around and you think, oh, I wish I had a choice. <laughs> no, it's part of your DNA. It's who you are. No longer living for yourself, but for Christ and his people. Does that map out in your reality? In how much time you live to serve God's people? And how concerned you are to be among his people and his community? Because there's a grumbling threat, isn't there? We saw it, and we'll come back to it in Nehemiah, this Tekoite nobles, this was beneath them. They were too proud to serve. No, we have our position. Just imagine how it would look, us getting our hands dirty in a wall. You cannot have that attitude in church. Humility is key, isn't it? We humble ourselves to serve one another. Pride threatens to harm and destroy. One wonders what excuses the nobles made. Sorry, I've got important ruling to do, and if I don't do it, you guys are going to suffer. Are you doing that in church life? What obstacles are there in your own heart to serving God's people? What excuses do you make? What grumbling and murmurings do you need to repent of? What breakdown or fallout have you, have you not sorted out? As Paul in Romans urges us, do everything as far as it depends on you to seek peace and reconciliation for the sake of the gospel. As he urges in Philippians to Euodia and Syntyche, make peace for the sake of the gospel. There's an opportunity for us to do this in a moment with communion. What do you need to give up or to give more of yourself to the people of God and the gospel? Now, there are threats from without, too. In fact, what this next chapter of Nehemiah reminds us is expect opposition. It shouldn't be coming from inside, so to speak, but it will come from outside. And that's what the next chapter tells us, and Peter is so clear on. There will be opposition. If you take Jesus seriously, this task of proclaiming God's excellencies will get harder for you. That's great encouragement, isn't it? That's why we need each other, to remind each other, as Nehemiah does. The opposition will come. Anne Rice is an author, name you may know. She was the authoress of The Vampire Chronicles. Don't worry, I'm not going to quote from The Vampire Chronicles. But she was writing a novel about Christianity some years ago. And like some, most novelists, she was trying to study her subject and she started reading New Testament scholarship. And she was astounded by the fact that so many of the people in the world of history and the New Testament scholarship actually seemed to dislike the person they were studying. This is what she said. Many of these scholars, scholars who apparently devoted their life to New Testament scholarship, disliked Jesus Christ. Some pitied him as a hopeless failure, others sneered at him, and some felt an outright contempt. I'd never come across this kind of emotion in any other field of research, at least not to this extent. It was puzzling. The people who go into Elizabethan studies don't set out to prove that Queen Elizabeth II first was a fool. They don't personally dislike her. They don't make snickering remarks about her or spend their careers trying to pick apart her historical reputation. Occasionally a scholar studies a villain, yes, but even then the author generally ends up arguing for the good points of a villain or for his or her place in history. But in general, scholars don't spend their lives in the company of historical figures whom they openly despise. But there are New Testament scholars who detest and despise Jesus Christ. You've seen that, haven't you? The point is, if you identify with Jesus Christ, you will be despised. That is part of the package. This harassed city discovered it too. Have a look at Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. 
Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews, and he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? I think there's a hint of panic in his voice. And so there are insults, verse 3, if a fox goes up, it's going to destroy the wall. It wouldn't, but... They've got to find some insults. And then there's intention and a plan to stop them. Verse 8, And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem to cause confusion in it. And then there are seeds of discouragement and fear being sown. Verse 10, In Judah it was said, The strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, They will know or see until we come among them and kill them and stop the, that work. And at that time, the Jews who lived near then came from all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us. It's too dangerous. Is this all over as the enemies of God here are all over the people of God? Surely it won't be long before the superior forces of the enemies would be all over the Israelites. And perhaps this next rebuilding attempt would be all over too. And who knows, maybe once and for all. I think of the drug and, and gang-infested communities in our, in our precious South Africa and how hard it must be and how discouraging it must be when the next person, the next innocent is killed by a crossfire in the gangs, those places ruled by drugs, and how the appeals go out, please help us, we're trying. How the community tries to band together and then it just unravels again and again and again. That hopelessness. Is it really going to change? Are we really going to get ourselves out of this mess? Is there hope? And as the pressure comes on the Israelites here, they're beginning to feel hopeless and despairing. What does Nehemiah do? Well, at least three things he does in response. You ready? Number one. Okay. First again, he shows himself a man of deep dependence on the Lord. So what does he do first? He prays. He prays. Verse 4 of chapter 4. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight. For they have provoked you to anger in the presence of your builders. First, he prays. Nehemiah recognizes he is not pulling the strings. He is not in charge. And so he talks to the one who is over all. Friend, when your friend comes to you in despair and struggling with something, will you please not be the Holy Spirit for them? Will you not be the Messiah? Will you be determined to pray and to point them to God's word? That's what we should always do in these circumstances. You may not have all the answers. That's okay. But he does. So talk to him together with that person time and time again. Will your instinct be to pray and go to God's word? Have that on your lips. Nehemiah shows us that time and time again. But are we to pray as Nehemiah prayed? Now, Nehemiah's prayer is a call for, for justice. Oh God, make them feel they're wrong. It's a call for justice, isn't it? To, and, and yet he prays, God, hold their sins against them. Do not forgive them. That's an astonishing thing. Did we read that right? It's the very opposite of what Jesus prayed on the cross before his enemies who nailed him there. Father, forgive them. Yes, we must cry out in injustice as Nehemiah did. We must long for justice and a righting of wrongs. Remember, even in Revelation, those saints who have passed longing for justice under the throne of heaven, saying in Revelation 6, How long, O Lord, before you avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth? They long for complete and utter justice to come. We must have that longing in our hearts. But notice the call. God, you take care of that. It's not for me to avenge. God, you judge. But what's different and why we don't quite pray exactly everything Nehemiah prayed is because we have something he didn't. We have the cross where God judged our Savior in our place. 
where the despising and the insults and the accusations and the threats and the persecutions fell on him. That's why we don't pray in the same way as Nehemiah did. You see, Jesus was despised and rejected, so we might not be. And ultimately, nothing can be done to us, to our reputation by persecutors, for that is where we look, to the cross, as Nehemiah did, when we face our enemies. And so when we face our enemies because of the cross, we love them, we forgive them, we seek with the mercy of God on our lips and our hearts, that they too might know him with the grace that he gives in our hearts by the Holy Spirit to love in a way and to forgive in a way we could not of ourselves. We can't without the Holy Spirit's help, can we? We can't muster that up. Think of that situation or that person you're finding it difficult to forgive. You cannot do it by yourself. You're called to, you're commanded to, in fact, to reflect the love and the forgiveness of Christ. But you need his help to do that. And so we pray, God, help me to forgive my enemies and to act in that forgiveness each day. But notice Nehemiah didn't just pray, and this time it wasn't fasting and praying for four months as he did at the beginning, but he's actually calling them to carry on building. Don't give up. This is hard now, but carry on. Keep living this out. Keep doing what God calls you to do. He says, verse 6, so we built the wall. So we built the wall. And verse 9, he posted a God. Prayed to God for help, and then he posts a God. A G-U-A-R-D. And then Nehemiah steps it up a gear later on in verse 13. To the extent that everyone is involved in the protection of the city. That in the end, you have essentially a building trowel in one hand and a spear in the other, a shovel in one hand and a sword in the other, a plumb line in one hand and a shield in the other. Have a look at verse 17. We were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. They're alert and they're ready, but they're getting on with the work. And they're helping each other to be alert. He'd started with the weapon of prayer and then he prayed for weapons in each one's hands and they took up arms to defend. They stand ready to fight, but they stand together. And they take their stand on who their God is and his word. And that's finally what Nehemiah does in his response to these threats, is he reminds the people of the great truths of the character and the promises of God, who has miraculously opened the way to set them to work there. That he is the God over all. And that is why this building project is not all over, nor will their enemies prevail all over them. Have a listen to his words. It's there in verse 14 of chapter 4. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. It's there in verse 19. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread and we are separated on the wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet rally to us there, our God will fight for us. We are laboring in our task, in his mission, for a God who fights for you. A God who fights for you. How does he do that? What does Nehemiah mean? Well, he looks back on all that God has done, perhaps even the rescue from the Exodus, miraculously at the hand of God. They played their part, but God freed them. God fought for them. God dealt with the Egyptians. And time and time again, Nehemiah sees and understands history and how God has fought for his people. This is battle language. It's like you find in the Psalms. He is our shield. He is our refuge. He is our fortress. It's something Israel had quite literally seen in their history against all odds. God bringing the victory, often unlikely. And it is made abundantly clear that their overcoming happens at the hand of God. And Nehemiah expresses his confidence that what God has purposed to do in setting him to work and gather and garner this people together, he will fulfill it. Take courage. It's like that tug of war contest at the Bura, what's it, Seikar Kaskanalis or Bura Sport? You know? 
And the unevenness of it, when one big lad takes hold of the one side of the rope, then you know it's all over. <laughs> it is with God. If God is for you, who can be against you? He will fight for you. How does he fight for you, Christian, this side of the cross? He fought for breath. He fought through the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours be done. Take this cup from me. The God, the fighting God, poured his wrath out on our Savior. So that you can overcome sin, death. So you can be forgiven and be a forgiver. And he's still fighting for you. He will not let go. What he began, Philippians 1, 6, what he started, he will finish. He's determined to. He's promised to. He will not give up on you. But oh, we need each other to remind each other, this God fights for you. Don't give up. It matters. It's worth it. Keep going. Keep your eyes set on the cross that God has fought for you, who has given his life for you, so that you can keep fighting the good fight of the Christian faith. Keep laboring for the God who has fought for you, for our fight is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers and the principalities and the powers of the dark. We're not fighting each other. My friends, let's not fight each other. And we're not fighting unbelievers. They're not the enemy. Satan has got a grip on them, is. So we fight through with the truth of the gospel that they might see and know and take a hold of it. This God is fighting for you. And at the end of the day, friends, it's a no contest. It's like a grade six Saints team taking on the first team at Great College. It's a no contest. I'm not from Great College, neither am I from Saints, I can say this. <laughs> but you get the picture. God is fighting for you. Will you fight along your brothers and sisters for this? Pause. Near my like, let's remind each other our God will fight for us. This matters. Let's keep going. Yes, it's a harassed city. We will be until Jesus returns, the city of God. But it's a holy city, his holy city. And he will hold on to his sheep and lead them through the gate into glory. Will you be numbered among them? Let's make the most of this, friends. Time is short. Let's make the most of our fellowship and our mission together. We'll talk more about this at our meeting. We're going to see it reflected now at our coming to the communion.